Hello everyone and welcome to Another Mother, a parenting podcast by My Spring Harvest with me, Emma Borkway. So I am 30 years old. I'm a mum of two little ones. I've got Ezra, who is three, and Hallie. She's the baby. She was born at the end of 2022. And I'm married to Isaac, also known as Governor B. He is a rapper, broadcaster, author. He just does a lot of things, which makes life unpredictable, but fun. Um, and so since becoming a family of four um, at the end of last year, I realized I can't actually just keep winging it the way that I have been. I need support. I need advice. I need help because I think almost like every parent ever anywhere, I have no idea what I'm doing. And I just really remember this one day, Hallie could have only been maybe like two months old, I think it was at the time. And my mum was around and I was holding Hallie, my baby, and Ezra, the toddler, was just, I'm calling him the toddler. He was literally just jumping off the sofa next to me. And I just felt like I was trying to hold it all together. And I looked my own mum in the eye and I was like, please just tell me one thing that I can do to make this all a little bit easier. Because her and my dad had raised me and my two sisters in an amazing, God-fearing household. And as the youngest of three children, for me, this looked really easy. I was like, wow, yeah, parenting, that must be so easy. I had a great time being a kid, so being the parent must be easy. Um, but I think now that I'm here in the thick of raising little ones, I realize it is very far from easy. And this can be a season that is often marked by loneliness, a lack of confidence, and um, you're constantly kind of doubting yourself and not sure what decisions to make. You're asking yourselves if you're doing it right because you so badly want to do a good job. Um, but I'd read in the Bible that children are a heritage and a reward. So I want to feel that as my reality, but it doesn't always feel like that. There's so much noise out there about how to be a good parent, what you're meant to do, what kinds of decisions that you're meant to make. There's opinion after opinion, and it just feels like quite a lot to sift through, and it can often be quite negative, and you end up not knowing where to land. So I decided, instead of just reading loads of stuff online, I'm going to speak to some of the best people that I know, that I trust, that aren't necessarily going to tell me how to be a parent, but maybe they'll just share some of their stories of what it's been like for them. Some of the people that I speak to will be alongside me in this journey um, at similar stages to me or other people may be way further ahead and have got children that they've seen grow up and they've gone through the teen years and oh my gosh like the I don't know seeing your children become adults and we'll just have so much more advice and wisdom to share um, but I do believe that these conversations will really help me just navigate some of these mysteries of parenting and take hold of the joy and that reward that is promised to us. And I want to record these conversations because I think that you're going to want to hear it too, wherever you're at on the journey. So I am very excited to announce my first ever guest on the podcast, more because I can't actually believe that we're having the opportunity to sit down and talk to each other uninterrupted. Um, but he is the person that I get to share this whole journey with. Please welcome my husband, Isaac Borkway. How are you? I'm good. I'm actually so excited to be able to talk to you. Um, That's what I like to hear. No, but don't you think now we don't really get to just talk? We had a great conversation last night. <laughs> no, but like day to day, we don't get to just sit and chat for like half an hour uninterrupted. Yeah, to be fair, it is quite rare. Uninterrupted. Yeah. Two kids, isn't it? Yeah, two kids. This is the life. But you do a lot of things. You're a busy man. You've got a very eclectic career. You've got an album coming out in May. You should know. Yeah. It's, it's May. In a, it's in a joint calendar. <laughs> You've got an album coming out in May, you work in broadcasting, you work for a church, but most importantly, actually, you are a newfound TikTok star. <laughs> I want to call myself a TikTok star, but yes, um, I am enjoying scrolling and posting family life, which is interesting because I've posted a lot of my music that no one seems to care about on TikTok, <laughs> but as soon as I put you up there, everyone loves it. What is it? Like, why do you want to make these videos? Basically, for anyone that doesn't know, Isaac makes these like day in the life kind of dad videos and then does a voiceover over the top that people seem to love because it's just very like dry humor. I personally enjoy dry humor. Um, but also, 
I think dads showing that they actually enjoy being fathers, especially dads from my kind of background, council estate culture, black. The representation on fatherhood hasn't always been super positive. There's a, a misconception that we can be absent fathers or not really that bothered. Um, and I think it's important to, to show that actually it's a privilege it's a blessing and I really enjoy it. I think the flip side is doing it in a way that doesn't come across like, oh, look at me. I'm so good because as we know, women do uh, parenting, parenthood very well and often don't get uh, applause or plaudits for it. So sometimes when people comment, oh my gosh, you're like the best dad in the world. I know their heart's in the right place, but I am like, at the same time, I'm only doing what I'm supposed to do as a father and there's nothing special about that. I love that. But for the record, I think you are an exceptional dad. Oh, thanks. Appreciate that. And the, How about husband? No, you're a great husband <laughs> too. I actually think we there's so many areas where we both know we do not work well together in. Like, I don't know. I feel like if we ever had to do like a building project or something, that would be a nightmare we just would argue the whole time you think yeah I think we don't work that well together but it surprises me that I think with when it comes to parenting or just like raising our children Ezra and Hallie I feel like we actually work quite well together in that aspect of life mm. do you agree yeah I do agree um yeah I wouldn't want to work with you no offense we have <laughs> very different working styles um I remember when we've done some bits together in the past I'm very much uh, like last minute, just vibe it out. You like to be planned and prepped and prepared. I do. So we don't always see eye to eye. The building stuff's been a bit better though, because I feel like I just end up doing like the big stuff. And then you will do like the, the really important details, like the decorations and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So maybe it's just you finding your roles. But yeah, I do agree that parenthood, parenting is the easiest thing for us to work together on for some reason. Yeah. It's weird. Do you feel like we do a lot of things differently? And by the way, you have a past to be very honest in this conversation. You have to be nice, but you can be honest. So like, is there something that I do really differently to you that you're like, what? Why are you doing that? If I'm honest, does it get left in this room or does it carry over into uh, <laughs> the house? It gets left in this room. We'll make a promise. All right, cool. Before I get onto that, I would say that I think the reason why we do parenting really well together is because we're always thinking about what's best for our children. Yeah. And that makes it a bit easier for us to get on the same page. Whereas if there's something trivial or something just between me and you, we're allowed to have our opinions. I'd prefer this because it's better for me. You'd prefer to do it this way because it's better for you. Um, but with the kids, it's like, no, man, it's not about us two. It's about them. And so it's a bit easier to swallow your pride. Agreed um is there stuff that you do that i'm like i think that you know through no fault of your own sometimes you're just a bit too uh, externally stressy for me <laughs> so for example last night fresh it's almost like hallie knew that we were doing this podcast this morning <laughs> He had, it was weird, didn't it? What would you call it? Like oh, yeah. Cold slash blocked no, nose? So, yeah, she was just, like, her nose was, like, bogey was just, like, flying out of her nose. Okay, so Emma says bogey was flying out of her <laughs> nose. Anyone that has experience of bogey knows that that's probably very unlikely. She had bogey in her nose. No, it and was running out of her nose. And she's okay. only, like, four months old. Okay, so let's meet in the middle and say she had a runny nose. And she was, like, you could hear her struggling um to breathe through her nose so that's fair anyone that's had a cold before uh, or bogey in their nose before knows that if you can't breathe through your nose because it's quite difficult you just breathe through your mouth okay but i actually googled it and apparently babies can't breathe through their mouth and this is not factual um <laughs> this is not a fact i just read it last night and i haven't verified it yet but i actually think it might be true the heli doesn't have to breathe through her mouth. I think they only breathe through their nose. Wow. And in the article, what age did they start breathing through their mouth? I don't know. Mouth? I didn't get that far. Is it? Right. Well, okay. Fair enough. But so Emma's response to that was, Isaac, she can't breathe. <laughs> I'm reading an article on Google at 3 a.m. in the morning. And I think we need to go to A&E. Whereas my response was like, mm, she's got a blocked nose. Let me carry her. 
rock her to sleep, take her dummy out, make sure she can breathe when she settles or put it back in, assess the situation, that kind of stuff. And I just think that, you know, yeah, that's definitely something we do differently. But then, to be fair to you, there was a time when Ezra was younger and we were walking through a park and he banged his head on the lamppost. Oh, yeah. And he had a fat bruise, like a big bump in his head. It like came out of his head, like how, I don't even know, like 10 centimetres out of his head. Yeah, it was it was pretty mad. And then you were like, we need to call that ambulance. And in that situation, obviously, you was right because I was a bit too chilled because I didn't want you to, you know, stress out. So I was like, no, it's fine, babes. And I was looking at him thinking, right, that's not fine. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think you're a bit of a, a, a an external stress head. Okay, fair enough. Would you say that's fair? No, I think you're right. Especially at night, I think I tiredness really gets me. So like, if I wake up from a deep sleep and something is happening, my like logical brain just is not present. Yeah, I had to take uh, take a step out of the room because the zen the zen wasn't quite <laughs> where we needed it to be. Okay, cool. I'll take that shot. Um, well, I actually think before Ezra was born, so before we ever became parents, I tried really hard. And you can tell me if I've done a good job at this or not. But I was always quite intentional to try and not be too overbearing. So like I might be stressy, but I never wanted to kind of like tell you how to do what what you need to do and I think I probably do that from time to time but like I didn't want to like get involved too much because I actually read I can't even remember what book it was that was about like how when children are raised in environments where people kind of care for them in slightly different ways they can learn to be more open-minded because they know there's not just like one route to success in life so like even though some mornings you will give Ezra a cheese sandwich for breakfast I just have to let that go because wrong with a cheese sandwich for breakfast <laughs> But the point is, is like... It's not like I'm giving him leftover Chinese. <laughs> no, but a cheese sandwich, that's lunch, that's not breakfast. But I'll just see it and I just have to like walk on by. To be fair to you, you are very good at that. I don't think you've ever put me under substantial pressure or been too overbearing or told me how to parent uh, unless you really need needed to, unless their safety was in, in question or anything like that. You're very free. And, and I actually think that's good because speaking to some of my, my male friends, when that pressure is there they just completely retreat because they feel like they can't do anything right. Um, so yeah, you are you are pretty good at that, I can't lie. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, we're now four months in to having two children. Some people warn you about the shift. Other people are like, no, it's fine. Like, it's no different. What do you think? Like, has it been a big jump going from one child to two? Is it different to what you thought it was going to be? Yeah, definitely, man. I think it's been very humbling for me. I've always kind of quite proud of the way I am in terms of whatever life chucks at me I ensure that that can fit within my life rather than thinking oh I've got to change everything now so when Ezra came along I was taking him to work on certain days I was taking him to the studio I was just didn't really affect me massively so I just thought oh I can do the same thing with Hallie but yeah with two kids it's, it's very difficult to do that one of them might be behaving well the other might kick off both of them might be kicking off at the same time takes longer to leave the house it's just a very different dynamic and then the other thing as well is maybe you would come home from work or I would come home from work and it's very easy to just hand one kid over yeah. you know it's your turn or whatever and then the other person can have a bit of respite but when we're both home and then one person has two kids that are kicking off the other person probably feels quite guilty that they're just on their own while the other's managing too and so I don't think there's much respite so yeah, man, it's been really humbling, uh, a lot harder. And yeah, I'm just trying to, we're just trying to find a, a rhythm, I think. But I don't think that that's possible for a while, maybe. Yeah, I have a plan for like a future episode of this podcast to speak to someone with like loads of kids. Mm. Because I feel like there must be a way. Because it's like, how do people just have so many kids if it's like this hard? <laughs> yeah. Also, we're quite busy people. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you're doing this podcast technically on maternity leave. Yeah. I've got a job. If I think I know uh, a couple that have a lot of kids, we both know, and they dedicate their whole lives to it. Mm. Their work involves their kids, so maybe it's not possible. Um, maybe it's possible. I don't know, man. Maybe we'll, we'll find out at the end of this podcast <laughs> series. <laughs> yes, maybe that will be our our mission to find out the answer to how do you have so many kids. Um, so one thing that I thought is actually quite different to what I thought it was going to be is my home birth 
Mm. So we had a home birth with Hallie um, because the birth with Ezra was all really lovely and fine. And then it was kind of a little goal of mine to like have a home birth the second time around. And Isaac is probably like the calmest, most, I don't know, unfazed person in the world. So I was like, a home birth is going to be so fine with Isaac. And when you tell your midwife that you want to have a home birth, they say like, oh, is your birth partner okay with that? Just because obviously like you've both got to be on board. And Isaac was always on board, like everything's fine. <laughs> but I feel like when I went into labor and you were trying to blow up that, um, <laughs> pool, not even blowing up the pool, you were trying to fill up the pool with water. It was just a new Isaac. Like what, what, what was the experience for you with the home birth? Yeah, one of the most stressful experiences i've ever had <laughs> basically the the birthing pool comes with a set of attachments which uh, work with various different taps so before day of labor i tested it out to ensure that the necessary attachment worked with our tap and it did i even you know opened the tap i saw the water was flowing through it pretty <laughs> well fine done. everything was great did a little test run and then for some reason on the actual day Every time I would attach the attachment to the tap and put the water on, it would just burst off, man. <laughs> so it happened the first two times. And after the third time, I was like, hmm, this is a big problem because you're in labor. Um, and so I kept trying. Then the water started like, I was trying harder. So I was getting more wrong. The water started like bursting in my face and stuff. He was coming into the kitchen to check if everything was okay. My whole face was covered with water, my clothes. <laughs> It was highly stressful. And then I just had to think of my feet, which I like to think is one of my strengths. And I just had to take it old school. Found a bucket and manually did about 76 uh, <laughs> it was a lot. trips from the tap to the birthing pool to fill it up. And then I think you just had to get in because Hallie was coming. Yeah. Even though I hadn't completely filled up the pool yet. And I just felt like that was my one job and I had failed at it. Oh, no, you hadn't failed. Um, but I felt like I had failed at the time. It was it was very stressful, but Aww. it was all good in the end. Apparently, people have like babies sometimes in cars and on trains and stuff. Yeah, so they do. No, yeah. it was fine. Yeah, I do remember. I just walked in and there was literally yeah, like water dripping from the ceiling, <laughs> and I was really like trying to be in my zone and like not get flustered myself or like not get stressed out because I just need to focus on birthing a baby. Um, but yeah, I had literally never seen you flustered in my life. And that was the first time. You were very calm though. Because half of my fear was, oh no, I'm getting it wrong. And the other half was, right, she's going to see this and kick off. I'm no. Get <laughs> <laughs> no, I was like ready to get in the bath or something. It was like, I knew I needed the water to like make me feel better. Um, but the midwife wasn't there at that point. And then by the time she got there, the pool was like half filled. And then I got in and yeah. you just carried on filling it up while I was in there. So it was fine. Yeah. It was good. It was it was a fun experience. Did you um you've actually never we've never I've never asked you this before and I've always wondered, but I don't know if you'd want to be honest or not. But like which which labor did you prefer? The one in the hospital or the one at home? Hmm, good question. I don't know if I have a, a preference, mainly because the one in the hospital was in did they call it the birthing centre? Yeah. So I feel like it was very similar yeah. apart from the location. Obviously, you had the opportunity to get in the water and feel comfortable, get in the position you wanted to be in. But then the safety net of being in the ward and the midwives being there was quite nice. Um, I think you were a lot more relaxed at home, which was nice to see, even like pre-labor, because I remember at the hospital. Actually, I prefer at home because I've just remembered... <laughs> At the hospital, we took a trip there. Yeah, we um, got sent home again. Got sent home, then took a trip back a few hours later and then wasn't ready. But instead of going home, we decided to wait in the car. Yeah. We were quite close. <laughs> but we were waiting in the car for hours. Like, was it three or four hours or three something? Three or four hours, but I had to keep my hand on your back <laughs> for three hours in the car <laughs> while I was trying not to sleep. And that was very long. Oh. Um, so being at home was quite nice because, you know, chilling on the sofa, you can like stick whatever show whatever music we want on it was just much more flexible um so yeah i'd go with the, the home birth for my final birth i oh, love that for you it's actually surprising to me that you prefer the home birth thing because i feel like it's quite um out of the ordinary and it's like but then maybe i don't know we're quite well, adventurous the, you gotta think that the paramount thing is that the person 
delivering the baby, i.e. you, yeah. is well, in the I, best... I'm not delivering it, I was birthing it. Birthing it. <laughs> in the best um, mental, emotional state yeah. possible. So seeing that being in our home did that for you, of course, would make it worth it. The actual blowing up the pool, putting the water in, don't even get me started on the clearing out the madness <laughs> that was in that pool was not my favorite job okay fair. but the fact that you wanted to do it and that made you happy and then that made your delivery safe and Halle the whole experience good for you that's what the overriding yeah feeling of joy is it was a beautiful experience and to have like my worship music playing although we had worship music playing in the hospital as well but it was just like it was actually very wonderful it was very grateful but in hindsight, I should have added some songs of my own to that playlist. Not actually my own songs, but my <laughs> own. The songs that I like that aren't Governor B songs. Because it's also my experience. Okay. Like, yeah. imagine if when I was trying to put the attachment on the taps, I had, do you know what I mean? A good song Okay, playing, well, any dads-to-be listening to this, just make sure you get some of your own songs there on the go. birth playlist. I'm sure your partner will be very happy that you've done that. <laughs> 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 oh, um, so, Isaac, when you were growing up, did you ever imagine what it was going to be like to have your own family? I don't know if like you thought about stuff like that or were there things that like your parents did that you were like, oh yeah, I would love to do that for my kids or like, oh, I wouldn't want to do that for my kids. Maybe more the positives. What would, what would you want to do for your kids? I never really lived the life very intentionally when I was younger. So mm -hmm. I always knew I would have a wife and kids, but I never really thought about, you know, learning from my parents and um, associating some of the positive behaviours to my life. But what I do remember is watching TV shows like Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, looking at Uncle Phil and saw like seeing how much of a, a good role model he was for Carlton, Hillary, Ashley and mm -hmm. Will. Um, I thought, yeah, man, I want to be an uncle or a dad like that. Or watching my wife and kids and looking at Michael and thinking, right, oh, he's sick, the way he talks to his wife, the way he makes her laugh, the way he has fun with his kids. That's what I want my house to feel like and be like. So I'd say that my main, um, you know, inspirations were what I saw on TV. Then when I got a bit older and my dad passed, I started thinking more retrospectively mm -hmm. about my upbringing and my parents and that's when I thought, oh, my dad worked really hard to provide for the family. That's something that I want to carry on. Or my dad would drop anything he was doing to give, to pick me up from the airport, for example, or drive my brother to uni. I want to be a dad like that. Um, and then you also think about the stuff that through no fault of their own, really, they weren't so good at. It's just we're human beings. We have strengths. We have weaknesses. So, for example, me and my dad would have very like surface level conversations a lot. But I'm like, okay, with Ezra, I want to do that. But I want to go deeper a lot. I want to, you know, ask him about his feelings. I want to talk about his emotions. I want to see what girls he's feeling at, nursery and <laughs> that. Do you know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, I think I, I looked at that stuff, but it was in retrospect rather than when I was younger. Yeah, I hear that. Your dad was an incredible man. Thanks, man. Yes. Um, What was it, like a year and a half before Ezra was born? Yeah, about a year. Yeah, and I think... At that point, like where I think when I fell pregnant and it felt like it hadn't actually been that long since your dad had passed away. So everything still felt very fresh. I think we always knew that it was going to be really important for us to want your dad's legacy to live on through our children and for them to feel like they knew him, even though they have never had the chance to meet him as such. But just for like his character to be something that we're able to share with them and mm. tell tell them about. So although actually I said earlier that we wouldn't work well together in a work capacity, we actually did work on a project together recently. So we wrote a children's book um, mm. that is out on June the 8th and it is actually very inspired by your dad. It's called Where Granddad Lives. Actually, do you want to share a bit about the story? Um, I think you should because it's kind of your idea. Oh, okay. So I guess, <laughs> so I was pregnant and it was actually an idea that I had that I really wanted to write a book for our child, like a ch children's book. And I was going to give it to Isaac as a gift when the baby was born. And it was going to be a story kind of like 
a fun way to share some of the things about Isaac's dad. Like he really liked Formula One. He loved certain music and like there's specific songs that he really liked and they would always be on at family parties and stuff. So it would kind of be including all of those elements so that our child felt like he would know his granddad and the things that he liked. Um, So my plan was to write that book and then give it to Isaac when our baby was born, but I didn't get around to doing it. And then I told Isaac about the idea, maybe like a year after, and he was like, oh my gosh, that's a great idea. We should do it. We should publish it. And I was like, oh, I don't know like if we can do that. And then he was like, yeah, of course we can. So then we kind of um, started like looking at the story again and we reworked it a bit um, and now it's getting published. And yeah, that's basically what it that's is. The basically a example of how our marriage works. <laughs> Emma comes up with a great idea and I run with it and then... That's a great teamwork. Take it to new levels. Great teamwork. Yes. But I guess the point of the story is to help the child kind of understand more of where they've come from because it's so identity forming, isn't it? To know like who went before you. And it's important that we are able to share the stories of the people who have gone before us. Um, A hundred percent. And also, you know, like as parents, it's our responsibility to help prepare our children for pain i don't think i was fully prepared for pain as a, a young child so when it happens you think oh my gosh it's the end of the world and one of the ways to prepare them is in a light way and in a way that's not too heavy and in a way that doesn't you know take away their innocence is normalize conversations around things like death and and grief and one of the things i hope the book does is you know keep the legacy of a loved one alive but also cr- help to create space for families to have conversations um, about good memories, about tough memories. And yeah, just help young people know that life's not always going to go your way, but there is a way that we can be optimistic and um, keep going. Yeah, definitely. And I think as well for the parents, like if there's a parent right now listening to this and they're grieving at the moment and they feel like they've got to hide it from their kids, like just knowing that you don't have to hide what you're feeling and what you're experiencing from your children, but you can kind of start to open up those conversations or start to kind of speak to them in a way that they can understand. So like, oh, mommy's feeling a bit sad because this happened and you can kind of, but say it in a way that is, easy for them to understand I think this book kind of gives a bit of like a not a blueprint for how to do that but it opens up that conversation so you could read this book and then be like oh should we talk about your granddad or should we talk Mm. about your grandma or somebody else who might have passed that you want to keep their memory alive but you don't want it to be like this thing where you feel like you're putting something really heavy on your child because that's not the point of it it's not meant to be a heavy thing it's meant to just teach them more about life and death is also a part of life oh, for sure and i think you you've actually taught me that kids are more emotionally intelligent than we can give them credit for because you're very honest with ezra so if you're crying or sad like if i haven't done the washing up or something <laughs> and you start having a breakdown and then you're crying and ezra says mommy what's wrong you'll be like oh mommy's feeling a bit sad mm. and then he'll come up to you and give you a hug and it's like he can handle you telling him that and he can contribute to making you feel better which is actually quite a nice thing where I think naturally I would probably hide that stuff from my child but yeah. you've shown me that actually within reason it's quite it's quite good to be honest with them about our feelings yeah because I think they pick up on it anyway don't they and if you if you're not explaining it to them it's kind of more just confusion I guess mm. um but yeah I guess it's all within reason and what's appropriate for your child and your situation um this might be a little bit deep but is there a way that you feel like you would want to be remembered by your children and your grandchildren oh great question um i think it's a challenge and you'll probably laugh because i don't always get this right but i saw a video the other day and a dad and his kid and he was he asked his kid a question like, would you rather me play PlayStation with you or play whatever game you want for an hour or give you this money to go and buy stuff? And then you can see the kid kind of thinking about it for a while. And he's like, no, I want to hang out with you for an hour. Aww. And yeah, it just made me realize that 
I want to be remembered by my kids as a dad that was like present and was hanging out with them, having mm. a laugh. I'd get on the floor with them. Yeah. I'd spend time. Rather, and I don't think there's anything bad with this. Um, I just think it's good to be present for your kids rather than, oh, my dad works really hard. Because I can say proudly, and I'm genuinely proud that my dad works really hard. But um, I could also say, oh, I would have liked to spend more time with him. Mm. So that's something I hope I'm remembered remembered for. And then also, being a parent that's kind of like, do as I do rather than just like do what I say. Yeah. I don't want my kids to grow up and think, oh, like you're a hypocrite. You don't even do that yourself. Whether it's, oh, you know, make sure you're saying your prayers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but dad, when was the last time you prayed? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um. So just be someone that backs my talk. Because yeah. they, you will get have that conversation. I don't know if you, with your parents, they might be listening, so you might not want to say. <laughs> but the first time you got a bit older and you realise... Yeah, whatever, man. They're hypocrite, man. They don't do that. They're <laughs> telling me to do this. But I remember those times, innit? Yeah. No, yeah, it's true. As as we get older, I think our yeah, perception changes slightly. And um, we also realise that people are just human as well. Yeah. And like nobody is perfect. And actually it helps as a parent to know, oh, I don't actually have to be perfect. I just gotta like love my kids and try my best. That's a great point though. So coming off the people are just human and Kids often see their parents as like superheroes yeah. that can do no wrong. How honest would you be with your your kids about your imperfections? Um, it's hard, isn't it? Because it takes self awareness anyway to be aware of your imperfections, mm. and then it takes that kind of confidence and removal of shame to be able to communicate about your imperfections without like shame just holding you back completely. So I would want to be. Uh, Losing the parent-child dynamic. Yeah. Sometimes it's kind of like you're more confiding in a friend than a child. Yeah, no, I don't think I would necessarily like confide in my children in that way. But mm. I think I would, I think it starts with being able to apologize when you know you've done something wrong. So even now, like some days I'll just get a bit stressed <laughs> and I'll just be like, Ezra, you just need to wait. Or like, I don't know, just be a bit yeah. like sharp. And I know he's just being a three-year-old. Like he's not trying to be mm. annoying. He's not actually doing anything wrong. Sometimes I'm he actually, does try and be annoying. yeah, he is sometimes a little bit annoying. But like I'm, I'm maybe actually just being snappy. And I think when I realise, oh, actually no, that was me reacting out of my own kind of shortcoming of maybe I'm impatient or maybe I've, I'm not like processing my stress well enough or I don't know. That actually I can just say, oh, I'm really sorry that I just. Um, was a bit snappy with you just then like mummy was a bit stressed I apologize and then he's always like that's okay mummy can you play trains and like just (laughs) moves on so quick but I think yeah being able to apologize for your children is kind of a way of acknowledging your shortcomings and showing them that like you're not perfect but also modeling to them like they're not going to be perfect either and it's okay to make mistakes you just gotta like own it that is good it's a good challenge yeah. Do you think it helps that he's like your cute little boy? Because I feel like I'd yeah. apologise more to Hallie than I would to Ezra. Really? Yeah, man. Because she's like sweet little girl and it daddy's mm. little girl. Ezra, I'll just be like, whatever, man. No, <laughs> I think you apologise to Ezra. I'm sure I've heard it before. Um. Anyway, right. We need to wrap this up. And I didn't want to end too emotionally because the other night we went to the theatre and it ended on a very emotional note. And yeah. I was li- like literally sobbing. And Wait, then guys, yeah, the lights this, turned on. <laughs> I don't know if there's going to be a lot of guys listening to this. Mainly for women, right? I don't know. We'll see. Parents. Do you ever think that, ah, oh, everyone's <laughs> going to think that I am the reason she's crying? Yeah, That's what I bad. always think. Well, it's bad. I'm just a proper crier. So it was like, yeah, the theatre ended. The lights turned on. Everyone was getting up to leave. And I was like, I'm not ready to go. Because <laughs> I was just still crying. I was like, oh, my God. So I was like, do you know what? I don't think anything should ever end on like an emotional note. You need to give the viewer or the listener an opportunity to like regain themselves mm, how so, thoughtful of you yeah i know so before i let you go um i i'm going to obviously be speaking to a lot more people throughout the series of this podcast i'm very excited um this first one has been with you so that we can kind of set the scene and set the context of where i'm coming from and <laughs> what my relational dynamic is um but what kind of questions do we actually need the answers to because this podcast is going to be very helpful for us in how to like raise our children. So what kind of questions should we ask people? Or should I ask people? 
on behalf of our family? A question that I would love to ask people Mm -hmm. is if both parents have some kind of purpose they would like to fulfill through their working life, is it ever possible to find a perfect balance between home, family and work? Or is it just a case of being aware of the different seasons of life and some seasons it's more work some seasons it's more family is there anyone that you speak to that has managed to maintain a perfect balance in a consistent fashion mm, great question okay i'm gonna add that one to my list and i will find the perfect guest to answer that question so our book where granddad lives will be out on june the 8th 2023 i'm very excited about that and i've written a bit more about the backstory and i've included some links of where you can pre-order it where you can buy it in an article over on my spring harvest so just go to springharvest.org and you create a my spring harvest account it is completely free and it gives you access to loads of different resources and articles and just things that you'll find really helpful Helpful. So um, head over there now and you can see the article that I've written. I'll also be writing a few more things and adding in some resources that are off the back of this podcast. So maybe if I'm speaking to someone and they have some book suggestions or um, different recommendations, or I'd love to actually make like some templates of things. I don't know. I'm not making any promises, but we'll see what comes. But there is also loads of other content on My Spring Harvest. There's stuff for your kids already on there that kids will love. There's some videos and just things that you already like. So head to My Spring Harvest now um, and check it out. Isaac, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. It has been a pleasure to have you here. It's been great to just have a whole conversation with you without a baby crying. And thank you to your mum for looking after Hallie in the house while we sit at the end of the garden to record this. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you for your honesty. And it's a pleasure parenting with you. Thank you for listening to Another Mother. Don't forget to subscribe for future episodes and I would love your help in spreading the word. So please do share this with your friends, other parents, mums, just anyone that you know that would enjoy it.